Okay. So she didn't want me to do a long introduction, so you all know who she is, and this is Helen Reddy. <laughs> Thank you, Dolores. Thank you all uh, for coming. I'm, I'm so happy you're here, and I'm happy to be here. Actually, I'm happy to be anywhere. I just love life. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my spiritual journey and parts of my life. Not too much about show business, but I think you already know most of that stuff. I, uh, I was born uh, on the 25th of October, 1941. So when you read that I was born in 1942, it's a lie. <laughs> and I was very sickly as a child. Um, I was covered head to toe with eczema. Uh, my mother thought I would be scarred for life. And when she used to take me on, on public transport, she would cover my face with a, a lace handkerchief because people would see this infant with the pus oozing everywhere and would move away from her. Um, I also had asthma, and um, well, I should finish talking about the eczema first. I, uh, when I was old enough as, as an infant to to scratch myself, they tied my arms with splints so that I couldn't bend my elbows. And uh, out of frustration, I would rub my head against the pillow and until it was bloody. Fortunately, I don't remember any of this. I do know I don't like being tied down, though. <laughs> Suspect that may be the reason. But then I had asthma on top of that, and um, I do remember going to hospital a couple of times and being put into an iron lung. And um, what I most remember is, is that it was like I was in this long hallway that kept getting narrower and narrower, and I was being squeezed, you know, like through the eye of a needle. And now I, of course, understand what that was all about. But um, when I was uh, six weeks old, when I say uh, I, was, I was born during the war, during World War II, but of course, living in a British Commonwealth country, I was born in Australia. Um, the war started for us on the 3rd of September, 1939. But when I was six weeks old, I developed chickenpox, and um, that's the week that Pearl Harbor was bombed. So I was just born about six weeks before, before America entered the war. Um, my skin cleared up, and I, as you can see, no scars. I'm, I recovered from all that. And at the age of four, um, my parents went to Perth, which is on the west coast of Australia. And that was when I started out in show business. And I don't remember the first time that I actually walked out on stage. Consequently, I guess I wasn't nervous. But I, I, I really loved it. I loved being part of what the family was doing. Both my parents were in show business, as was my sister. And I just felt very much at home on the, on the stage. And I would, um, in the afternoon, in the children's pantomime, the, the show they used to put on at Christmas time, I was an audience plant. Um, my father would come out, you know, dressed as the dame, and they, the screen would come down with uh, words to a, a song. It always a nonsense song. And then he would say, you know, is there a little boy or girl who'd like to come up and sing with me? And boom, I was up like a shot. <laughs> and at the end of it, uh, he would say, you've never seen me before, have you, little girl? And I'd say, no, daddy. <laughs> and, you know, run off into the wings where mummy was waiting, and I was thrilled that I got a laugh. I mean, it was, it was great. Um, then we came back to Melbourne. That's where I'm originally from, Melbourne. And uh, at the age of six, I started school. 
And I also um, was very religious as a child. And I don't know where that came from because uh, neither of, I never saw either of my parents go to church ever unless someone's baby was being christened. There was, they just didn't go. But I went, every Sunday there I was off to church, loved Sunday school, really into it. I was going to be a missionary. Well, I couldn't be a minister because women weren't allowed to do that. And I thought if I was a missionary, I could travel, and I would also have a certain amount of autonomy. I'd be away, and I wouldn't have to report back to anybody. And then someone said, well, you know, if you're a missionary, you won't be allowed to wear lipstick. That was the end of that. Anyway, I was about nine years old, and I was becoming very disillusioned with Sunday school. You know, one week the Sunday school teacher was telling us, I was a Presbyterian, that, you know, we were the only true religion, you know, the Catholics didn't know what it was all about, and the Church of England didn't know, and the Methodists were wrong, and everybody was wrong but us. The next week was world brotherhood and our oneness with all faiths <laughs> and I'm thinking something's wrong here and I was asking questions and not getting any answers if they couldn't answer it was just you must have faith that was it you must have faith that didn't answer my questions so at the age of nine I became an atheist <laughs> and loved to get into arguments with anyone who believed in God. After all, I'd, I'd read Bertrand Russell, so I had my arguments already, you know. Well, um, when I was 11, I had an experience that changed all that. I was in, I was in school, and it was an all-girls school, and we wore identical uniforms, and we used to uh, assemble in the mornings for assembly, and we would have, you know, the headmistress would come and we always stood for the in, entire duration. And being in, in um, well, at that point I was my first year in what we called senior school, what you would call junior high, I guess, in the United States. And, um, you know, we would sing a hymn and she'd say a prayer and talk about something or other. Well, this particular day, the headmistress had a, a phone call that held her up. She was delayed for some time. And we're standing and we're standing and then finally she came and um, the assembly began and she was, I remember she was talking about Robert Louis Stevenson. It's funny the things that stick in your mind. And I was feeling kind of weird. I was seeing like brown spots in, in front of my eyes and I had an urge to put my hand on the shoulder of the girl standing in, in front of me and I thought, oh, I better not do that because she might, I might startle her and I don't want to cause a scene. And the next thing, I'm at the back of the room and I'm looking down. No sense of passage of time or, or, or place. And, oh, one of the girls down there has fainted. I wonder who it is. <laughs> and, of course, I'm, and I'm there. Once again, no sense of movement. I was just, I wanted to be there, so I was there. And I'm looking at myself. And I thought, oh my God, I've died. <laughs> and the next thing I remember, I must have gone back into my body at that point, because the next thing I remember, um, the girls were carrying me out, and I got banged against the door jam. And that, that brought me back into consciousness. Well, this kind of threw my atheism a little off kilter because that body was something that I was inside. It wasn't really me. The I that was me existed separately. This was a lot to think about. Bertrand Russell. So... Um, I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't tell anyone. What could I say? They wouldn't understand. I'd never heard of such a thing. Who leaves their body and comes back again? Never heard of it. I thought, they'll, they'll lock me up. I'll be in a mental hospital. I mean, I, I couldn't tell anyone. And I kept it to myself for many years until eventually I, um, I read an account by a yogi 
of an out-of-body experience. He called it astral projection. I thought, that's it. That's, I'm not the only one. That's it. So uh, it wasn't until, uh, I think it was about 1953, a book came out called The Search for Bridie Murphy. And that was my first realization. Um, first of all, I was very familiar with hypnosis because I was in show business. I'd seen, you know, I'd seen the stage hypnotists and, you know, they were magicians. They, as far as I was concerned, it was, it was show business. It wasn't anything real. But here was somebody using hypnosis as a tool for research. I found that fascinating. And there was something about the life that, um, I'm trying to remember her name, the woman who he regressed, Virginia something. Anyway, the Irish life that she described, it just rang true. And I thought, well, I, I have to find out more about this reincarnation business. And, but of course, the, you know, where? Where did you find out anything? You didn't talk about these things in those days. Remember, this is the early 1950s. Any of you alive then? Okay, so uh, when I was 17, um, I, uh, I had to wake my parents up one night because I was in absolute agony and I said, you, I need to go to a hospital. And I had an abscessed kidney and um, they did some exploratory surgery, and they said the kidney is, well, they didn't tell me, they told my parents. The kidney was like twice the normal size, and they said, we're, we're going to have to take it out. And I was very, very lucky that they did it so quickly because the kidney actually ruptured on the operating table. And it was very touch and go there for a while. But... Uh, once again, I was down that hallway, being squeezed. But I did survive, and um, I mean, I thought that was the end. I thought I was, you know, I was working as a dancer by this time. I was 17, and loved dancing, absolutely loved it. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll never dance again. I won't be able to have children. I mean, I, I took it hard. But after six months of... Uh, of convalescence, I did go back, well, I can still sing. I can still sing. And that was what I went back and, and started doing. Um, now, I was uh, on tour with a show. Now, I would have been about, I think, about 18 or 19 at this point. And the star of the show was a hypnotist. And so I used to stand in the wings every night and watch how he chose his subjects. He was lucky that he didn't have loud music playing outside while he was doing it. <laughs> However, um, so I used to stand there and I would watch. He would, you know, people would come up and he'd do, you know, little tests with them, and then he'd send a lot of them back. And the ones that he sent back, I noticed, were not very suggestible. He, he chose the, the people that he thought he could do something with. Now, I had no desire to make anybody, you know, quack like a duck or do any of the stupid things that stage hypnotists do. And I was not able to engage him in any sort of conversation about reincarnation because... Uh, so, uh, but I, I did learn how to put somebody under. And we were in this little town, and um, so little there was only one place to go, which was the hotel that we were staying at, the, the, the bar in the hotel. And I, I've never been a drinker, but that was the only place to go. So I'm there, and I'm with some of the local people, and um, one of them was this young man, I don't remember his name, I call him Bill in the book. But he said, well, he said, I was hypnotized once. He said, I was out in the bush and I, I fell asleep with my head against a log and 
When I woke up, he said, there was a snake right there and it was staring at me. He said, and I couldn't move, I was paralyzed. And I thought, oh, if a snake can hypnotize this guy, maybe I've got a chance. <laughs> so um, I put him under and I used some deepening techniques and you brought him up and put him down, brought him up and just had some fun, you know. And I was using a, a click technique where I'd click my fingers a, a couple of times and he would go back under. So uh, anyway, some of his friends started coming in. The bar was now beginning to fill up. Some of his friends came in. So he moved down to the end of the bar and he was hanging out with his friends and lots of people were coming in and it was becoming very noisy. <laughs> and uh, I'm still with the people that I, you know, had been with originally and we were talking about what had happened and they were quite fascinated by the whole thing and I was flushed with success, you know, my first hypnotic subject and I said yes I said and can you believe all I had to do was and I clicked my fingers and I see Bill at the far end of the bar he's got his back to me he could not have heard the clicks over the noise he slumps so I am now terrified because I'm messing with something I don't don't really know too much about and this can't be just hypnosis obviously something telepathic is going on so I had to go down the end of the bar and bring him out of it but the experience scared me so much I stayed away from hypnosis for quite a while uh, however I was still continuing to have these experiences um, one of them I, I, I remember um, I was still living in Melbourne. I'd, I'd made the decision to move up to Sydney. I was 18, and there were a lot more opportunities for a singer in Sydney than there were in Melbourne. And about 10 days before I left, I'm lying in bed and I'm thinking, Helen, that's because that's, that's what I call myself. Um, <laughs> I said, Helen, you don't know anybody in Sydney. You have no family in Sydney. You have no friends in Sydney. You have no job. What are you thinking? I think I'm going to go to Sydney is what I think. But I did go to sleep that night with some doubts in my mind. And I had this peculiar dream. I was in a church. No, it was a recording studio. No, it was a church. No, it was a recording studio. You know how in dreams that you, things change? And I was singing a duet. Never sung a duet in my life. I was a soloist. With... Um, a well-known soprano, I had, I had met her because uh, she'd been in a, a show that my sister was in, but I'm singing a duet with a soprano? What a weird dream. Well, I got up to Sydney, and um, shortly thereafter I get my first job, and it's a radio show with the ABC, which is like the BBC, only it's Australian. And uh, the job was to... Uh, you know, just come in, just pick up a piece of music, because I could sight read, and sing the song, and that was it. Well, I get to the address, 226 Burke Street, and it's an old colonial church that has been deconsecrated. There's still the stained glass and the pulpit and everything, but all the pews have been pushed aside, and there is recording equipment in the center. And my job was to sing a duet with the soprano. So that's, uh, I've, I've, I've had a lot more faith in dreams since that occasion. Now I'm going to jump ahead now. I got married, bad idea, had a child, good idea, um, won a contest. And the contest took me to the United States. And uh, I started out uh, in New York and uh, moved on to Chicago because I had a job there. Um, I was uh, in a, uh, a review at the Happy Medium Theatre and I was also singing at Mr. Kelly's. Anyway, this was 1968 and it was an election year and I'd become quite, quite fascinated by US politics. And um, Bobby Kennedy was running, and, and um, he, he wanted to stop the war in, in Vietnam, which I thought was a very good idea. So although I was not a voter, of course, uh, I, was, I was following him with interest. 
I was also at that time uh, practicing Hatha Yoga and meditating. Anyway, in one of my meditations, I suddenly see the date, June 6th, 1968, and it's edged in black. Well, I didn't find out until later that when you see a date edged in black, it's an obituary. But I knew that he was going to be out of politics forever on that date. However, uh, you know, his, his brother had only been killed five years before. You, I interpreted that to mean that he was going to lose the California primary, which was coming up, and he would drop out of the race and he would never run for office again. Well, um, I'm watching the television, and it's the California primary, and he's won. And he's standing there with his wife Ethel by his side, and he says, and it's on to, on to Chicago. That was where the convention was being held. It's, it's, it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. And he flashed the peace sign. And I turned the TV off, and I said, thank heavens, that vision was wrong. Went to bed. Next morning, I woke up, I opened the door, there's the paper with the headlines blaring that he'd been shot. Well, he was shot on, uh, oh, I should mention that when I first had the vision, I went into a three-day depression that I, nothing like I've ever experienced in my life. I couldn't move out of a chair, I, di I didn't brush my teeth, I didn't eat, I was in this black hole for three days. And I racked my brain. I couldn't think of anything that could possibly have caused it. Well, Bobby was shot on June the 4th. And um, his, uh, no, I'm, I'm, his, the primary was on the 4th. He was shot after midnight. So he was shot on the 5th. And he was brain dead. They took him off life support on the 6th. So that was the three days and that accounted for the depression. So um, that affected me so deeply. I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not practicing Hatha Yoga anymore. I'm not meditating anymore. If it makes me this, this sensitive, I, just, I don't want to know. And shortly thereafter, I moved to, to California, where I met with absolutely no success whatsoever for nine months. And... <clears throat> It got, I mean, I shouldn't say no success. I did work a couple of state fairs. And um, I couldn't afford to have an accompanist. So I had a guitar. But I couldn't mic the guitar because I couldn't play. So I, <laughs> so I just sang and moved my fingers a lot. And anyway. After nine months, I thought, well, you know, I, I don't understand this. I've got, had all these years of experience. And, and surely, I mean, just even if I had no talent at all, surely that, the, the amount of experience I, I've had would get me a job somewhere. I thought, well, if I'm not going to make it in show business, I'm going to have to find something else to do. So I enrolled at UCLA and went back to school. Now, one of the courses that they had, and this was a, this was a first, uh, Dr. Thelma Moss, who has since passed on, she was giving the first ever course in parapsychology. And, and I'd read all about um, Dr. J.B. Ryan's work in uh, North Carolina. And I thought, well, I have got to take this course. Well, so many people signed up for it, they had to move it from a classroom into an auditorium. And one of the assignments she gave us was to write about a psychic experience, if we'd had one. Well, I wrote about my out-of-body experience. Well, out of the hundreds of um, assignments that she, that she received, she read three out loud. Mine was one of them. So I thought, well, you know, somebody believes me. So that, was, that was a moment. And I really, at that point, there was, there was a lot more reading matter was coming out. Um, Any time I could get my hands on a, a transcript of a past life regression, I, had, I started developing a library. And um, I love history. I love biography. 
here was, and Dolores shares this with me, here's a time tunnel. I can take somebody back to the past and I can get the truth and find out what really actually happened. So um, I did once in a while give somebody a regression. But I was still very nervous because I didn't feel that I was qualified. Even though I'd d done all this reading and, and amassed a fair amount of information. Um, I didn't complete my time at UCLA because I got a job. And it was on The Tonight Show. Um, when, while I was living in, in Chicago, um, my second husband was booking a lot of talent for the room and um, Flip Wilson was one of the people who came in to play at Mr. Kelly's. And so we used to hang out and when we got back to, when, when we got out to California, we of course looked him up and he got to guest host the show and he had me on. I think I was on at three minutes to one. I was the very last act to go on. But somebody from Capitol Records saw me and I got offered a recording deal to make a single, two sides. Now, what am I going to sing? I didn't want to record something that had already been done to death, you know, and, and I certainly, I never thought of myself as a songwriter. I mean, I, I wrote poetry, but I never associated poetry and lyrics. I don't know why, but I, I never made that connection. So um, I was watching, you know, one of the late night talk shows, and Mac Davis came on and sang a song he'd just written called I Believe in Music. And it was upbeat and had a very positive message and I thought, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the song that I'll, that I'll record. Well, I needed something for the B-side. And the head of A&R at, uh, at Capitol, the one who had signed me, said, well, you know, have you heard this new album that's just come out, Jesus Christ Superstar? He said, there's a ballad on there. He said that you, you could sing that. Well, there was not only the album version that was out there, there was also another singer who had recorded the ballad, I Don't Know How to Love Him. And quite frankly, I didn't care for the song too much, but I thought, well, it's on the B-side, who's ever going to know? They'll, ne they'll, ne they'll never listen to it. The end of that session, and I don't think I've ever been as nervous as I was at, at that session, and I'm standing in the control booth and I'm, I'm listening to the playback and... I believe in music sounded like I believe in terror. I mean, that my nervous just, my nervousness permeated the entire track. And, um, but when I listened to I Don't Know How to Love Him, the emotions that I was feeling worked for that song. And they said, well, we'll flip it around. We'll make that the A side. And I thought, well, that's the end of that. There's already two versions out there. Well, there was this one little radio station in Hartford, Connecticut, that decided to play my version. Now in those days, you could ring a radio station from, you could ring anywhere without, without caller ID. They didn't know where you were calling from. So I, using different voices and accents, <laughs> and family and friends, fortunately I had friends who were actors, we all started calling up the radio station and requesting Helen Reddy singing I Don't Know How to Love Him. They in turn, that the station reported back to the, uh, to the dealers that they were getting heavy action on this. <laughs> and it actually made it to number 13. Now, this presented Capitol Records with a problem because they don't make money on singles, they make money on albums. They suddenly had a hit artist on their hands and no product. So they said, quickly, get into the studio and uh, here's a list of the top 40, we want you to sing the top 10 songs, you can cover the top 10 songs and everybody will recognize the names of those songs and then they'll, and I said, no. I've waited 25 years to record. 
I'm going to sing what I want to sing. And I wrote a couple of songs for the album. One was called Best Friend, which is a song I sang as the singing flying nun in Airport 75. <laughs> and the other was I Am Woman. And it got no airplay whatsoever. But I used to open my live show with it, and I got strong reaction from the audience on that song. And I also noticed that um, fan mail would mention it. So um, this uh, film was being made at Columbia Pictures to cash in on the women's lib fad and it was a, a movie called Stand Up and Be Counted, and they wanted to use I Am Woman over the credits. So Capital said, well, we've got to put the, put the song out now as a single. But it was too short. I'd only written two verses and two choruses. So I wrote a third verse and a third chorus. We went back into the studio and we re-recorded the song. And that's the version that became the hit and was on my third album. The movie opened and closed in six days. <laughs> However, um, that kind of led to a lot of other, you know, I finished up having, I don't know, around about a dozen uh, top 40 hits. I'm not into numbers. Do you remember what was number one last year? On the, you know, it, it's, I'm not into numbers. The important thing was I was working. <laughs> So, uh, 19, in, in terms of Korea, 1973 was probably the biggest year in my life. First of all, in December of 1972, I gave birth to my son. That, the same week that I Am Woman went to number one. It was interesting because I'd gone all over the country singing I Am Woman, you know, with the belly out to here. <laughs> and at that time, anybody who was a feminist was immediately branded a lesbian. Well, they couldn't say that about me, could they? <laughs> so, um, but, uh, and then uh, in the summer of 1973, I had my own television show, a summer show on NBC. I had three number one hit singles that year. I also had to deal with three deaths that year. Uh, my mother in July, my best friend in August, my father in September. And I think it was in November of that year, I was in an almost fatal plane crash. Um, I was in a, a, a chartered plane. I just left Philadelphia and we were going back to California and being such a small plane we had to land twice. Well, the pilots didn't tell us that the radar wasn't working, and we hit a thunderhead, and it was like hitting a brick wall. And all of a sudden, we are, we're, we're going down, and the interior of the plane started breaking up. Some of the panels were popping out, and uh, some of, one, one guy started screaming, another guy was praying. My husband and I said goodbye to each other. And by some miracle, the pilot was able to, we were up to, I don't know, well, at least one and a half Gs. And all of a sudden, the pilot gets down to a, a, some clear air, and he's able to pull it out. And we landed. And I wanted to go up again immediately, because I felt if I don't fly right now, I will never fly again. However, nobody else wanted to fly with me, they just, <laughs> including the pilots. So uh, that put a kibosh on that. But we did take a commercial flight the next day, and uh, I still love to fly. I still love to fly. In fact, I can get off a 14-hour flight. I can look up in the sky and see a plane and wish I was on it. Terrible, isn't it? OK, so. Um, as well as the deaths, uh, I had another problem to deal with, and that is that uh, husband number two, uh, husband number one was an alcoholic and he was a, a physical abuser. That's why 
I left when I was pregnant with my daughter. Husband number two didn't drink. I thought, ha. However, he was a drug addict and a gambler and a womanizer. Not good husband material. And he chose that time when I was really emotionally very vulnerable. He chose that time to start being emotionally abusive and verbally abusive. And um, I really didn't have much in the way of resources. And uh, I'm a water sign. And when I'm troubled, I like to go to water. I don't care if it's a pond or a lake or a river, preferably the ocean, because there's something about the regular rhythm of the waves that is, dare I say, hypnotic. And um, I would sit there and ask for guidance. And I would always get some sort of answer, some sort of peace that would come over me. And this particular day, I'm, I'm praying, and, and um, I said, you know, it's not, it's not my faith in you that I'm calling into question because my faith in you is unshakable. It's your faith in me that I am questioning. I need to know I'm on the right path. And I also sp spoke to my mother, and I said, you know, I, I wish you were still here, Mum, but um, I know you love me, but I really wish you could just reach down and, and tell me I'm a good girl. Well, I sat there for a few more minutes and nothing was happening. I said, oh, okay, you're busy today, I understand. Other people, problems far greater than mine, it's okay. I'll try again another time. And I pulled my car onto the Pacific Coast Highway and I'm headed for home. And I'm only driving a matter of seconds when I notice that the car in front of me has a personalized license plate. It says, good girl. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so... Um, these are the kind of experiences that I've had in my life. And I'm going to jump forward here because uh, I don't particularly want to talk about my career. I played here, I did this, I went there. Um, I did divorce husband number two. <laughs> we won't even go into husband number three. I was meant to be single. I really was meant to be single. And um, so anyway, I'm, I'm leaping forward now to the millennium, to uh, 2000 going into 2001. And I was living in a house that I'd bought in Santa Monica. And I'd been living there for, oh, about 17 years, I think. And I, I decided to sell up because the, the kids were grown and gone and I wasn't really, I mean, I was working all over the country, but I wasn't really working in California. And I thought, well, why, why am I still here? I'm, I'm rattling around on my, I mean, I had eight, eight bathrooms in this house. I, I didn't need eight, but one was fine. <laughs> uh, so I'd, I'd made the decision to sell. And... Um, I also, after Bush was selected, with that one vote on the Supreme Court, and I do see the future from time to time, and I saw what was coming, and I said, I, I don't want to live here. I don't want to live here anymore because America is going to change. And so I thought, well, where can I go? I really didn't, I really didn't know. And I, and I wanted to get out of show business. I had all these other interests. I was, you know, apart from my spiritual interests, I was also, um, I'd become a qualified genealogist. I've traced uh, three branches of my mother's uh, tree back uh, 250 years. I, I had other interests. I wanted to do something else with my life other than sing Delta Dawn for the 9,000th time. <laughs> So uh, I had a visit. I had a visit from a friend who popped by. She'd, uh, we'd missed each other at Christmas, so she stopped in to uh, give me a belated Christmas gift. And she had one of her many nephews with a large, large family. And um, 
Her nephew said, I was just learning about you in school. Uh, and I'm thinking, he looks too young to be at university. I'm thinking maybe there's some course they're giving on female singer-songwriters or whatever. No, I'm in high school, he said. And uh, in our modern American history high school textbook, he said that the chapter on the 70s, he said, the lyrics to I Am Woman are in there and you're mentioned. And that stopped me in my tracks. Because, yes, I'd wanted to come to America and I'd wanted to be a star. I never in my wildest dreams imagined I would become part of American history. And uh, I didn't know how to process it. I cried for three days. I cried for three days nonstop. I felt so humble, I felt so grateful, I felt it was, it was quite amazing. And, uh, but I still didn't know what, what I wanted to do. I didn't know where, where was I supposed to go. It was like I was really at a crossroads in, in my life. And uh, so I'm sitting at home, it's, it's New Year's Eve, and I'm sitting at home alone and I'm watching television. And I've turned off pretty much all the lights in the house. There was um, t two lights that I'd left on. I had a, a staircase in my house in Santa Monica. And there were identical light fixtures embedded in the ceiling, both the bottom landing and the top landing. And each of those light fixtures had two bulbs, 60 watt bulbs. Now, both of them, one bulb had gone out. And I thought, well, I may as well wait until one of them's completely gone dead and then I'll get the ladder and change them all. Well, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden it's very bright. And I walk over to the stairs and both top and bottom, these lights are, these dead bulbs are burning like 150 watts, very, very bright. I thought, gee, that's odd. I wonder if it's a power surge. Or didn't seem to be. Well, the light stayed that way until I went to bed and I turned them off. The next morning I got up and I put them on and back to the old one each 60 watt bulbs. And I thought, gee, that was weird, wasn't it? You know. The next night the same thing happened again. Now they've got my attention. <laughs> Helen means light. Lights on an ascending staircase. Okay. I'm ready to listen. And um, oh, I can't begin to express what I experienced. There, there, there are no words. Um, I definitely had angels in my house. I have never felt such unconditional love. It was like somebody who sees into the, the deepest part of you, knows all your secrets and loves you unconditionally. And, and I was just so full of gratitude and humility and, and I have never felt so loved in all my life. It was amazing. I was in a state of bliss. And I kind of got the message what I was supposed to do. It's okay, Helen, you don't have to keep singing all those hits. It's okay. You can stop. But life isn't over. You still have work to do. First of all, I was made aware that, I mean, I knew, because I've had a lot of past life flashes, I knew that I'd been a, a, a man in a lot of my past lives and that I had not always treated women well. Now, instead of having to come back again and again and again and again and atone for every single one of those sins, through the medium of music, I had been able to reach so many women, I had wiped out the debt. And that was a big relief. But there was still work for me to do. I was to write a book talking about my experiences and I was to lecture and talk. 
And as I was so interested in hypnotherapy, why didn't I do something about that and get a degree? So I did. I, um, I knew that Florence Henderson, who was a friend, was married to a hypnotherapist. And um, I think I got in touch with her on the 3rd of January. And uh, it turned out that her husband, who's since passed on, Dr. John Campus, he ran the only accredited school for, for clinical hypnotherapy in the United States. And uh, so I met them for lunch on the 5th, and I was able to transfer my credits from UCLA in, in psychology and parapsychology, and I started on the 8th. And I took on a double course load so I could, I could graduate in, in, you know, within a year. Sold my house, moved into a little motel that was just down the road from the, from the college, and I went to school seven days a week. And I loved it, absolutely loved it. And at the age of 60, I got my degree in clinical hypnotherapy and neuro-linguistic programming. But I also had this thing that I, I needed to leave the United States. I knew that that was something I needed to do. So I finally decided to move to Norfolk Island. Ever heard of it? Most people haven't. It's a little island. It's between Australia and New Zealand. And um, I had a family connection there, actually, through my, uh, through my genealogical research. Um, I knew that I'm a... I'm a sixth generation Australian, and I'm the direct descendant of a First Fleet convict. Oh, laugh if you will. <laughs> but 40,000 convicts came to the American colonies before the War of Independence. They only got sent to Australia after you got rid of the British. <laughs> so I could, have been, I could have been born here instead. Um, by the way, um, I researched that ancestor, and he was, I know they all say they were framed, but he truly was not guilty of the crime that he was, he was charged with. He, uh, he'd been a whistleblower. He'd reported that somebody um, where he was working was committing fraud, and um, somebody very powerful, who I guess was benefiting from the fraud, trumped up these charges against him and he was shipped off so he couldn't testify. But he had, um, after he'd been in Sydney for a, a short amount of time, he was sent to, to Norfolk Island, which was uh, at that time a reward for good behavior. And uh, so I had that, that family connection and then I learned that um, um, one of his grandsons had gone back to Norfolk Island during the second um, settlement period because they closed, they, they sh they, they, the first settlement they shipped everybody, ooh, excuse me, they shipped everybody down to Tasmania and closed the settlement down and raised most of the buildings because they didn't want the French coming in and taking over because the French were lurking around in the waters at the time. So his grandson, um, who would have been my great-grandmother's brother, went there during the second settlement as um, a superintendent of agriculture. Then they closed the settlement down again. That was a very bad period. That was where, when there was a tremendous amount of cruelty and, and torture and all kinds of horrible things went on there. The third period of settlement was when the Bounty mutineer descendants who were on Pitcairn Island had overpopulated the island and they appealed to Queen Victoria for another homeland and she sent them, she gave them Norfolk Island. And my uh, great grandmother's brother went there. Now, I, I didn't understand how, why he was there as a US consul. What was that all about? Because this was during the whaling period. Well, um, the brother that had the, his, his uncle had been the one who had been there in the second settlement. He had two brothers who pioneered Wellington, New Zealand. They were the first to take cattle, horses, and whaling gear across, across the Tasman Sea there. 
The youngest brother drowned. The oldest brother, when he heard about the gold rush in California, went to San Francisco. And he became an attorney. And according to his obituary in the San Francisco newspaper, he campaigned for Abraham Lincoln. So there's all these interesting sort of... Get into your family history because, believe me, you're going to learn things you could never have imagined. So um, I decided, uh, because I had family on, on Norfolk Island, in fact, one of my cousins is married to Colleen McCulloch, I decided I, I'd, I'd try living on Norfolk Island. And um, I was staying with, with Cole and, and, and Rick, and, and I was looking at houses to buy, and I just couldn't find anything. And anyway, I was driving back with the, uh, with the real estate agent, and he said, do you mind if I just stop off here for a minute? He said, this, this property is going to be t coming on the market soon, and, and I want to take a look at it. Well, as we're going down the driveway, I said, I've, I've been to this place. Now, the owners, um, because tourism is the biggest industry on Norfolk Island, the owners um, used to have a garden tour. And so I'd been on the garden tour, and I'd also been inside the house on the diner round, the, um, the progressive dinner. And I remember being in that room and thinking, gee, I, I could be comfortable here. I knew as I was going down the driveway I was going to buy that house. Now, in between making that decision and actually signing the deed, I found out that my great-great-great-great-grandfather, the first fleet convict, that had been his first property, and my great-great-great-grandmother had been born right there on the 15th of February, 1792. So I was meant to have that, that house. And it's, it's actually a farm. It's a four-acre hobby farm. And uh, I don't live there. I, I visit there. Um, I live in Sydney. I wanted to be closer to my sister. I have an older widowed sister, and I wanted to be close to her. So I, uh, I rent a place in Sydney, and I go across to the island every, every once in a while. And um, I'm, very, uh, I'm very interested in, in sustainable living. Um, we're currently constructing hydroponics, um, actually aquaponics, was a, which is a combination of hydroponically grown vegetables and fish farming. And uh, in the space the size of a garage, you can feed a family of four. It's, it's quite amazing. The, the wastewater from the fish tank fertilizes the plants, which in turn clean the water and send it back to the fish. You only need about 10% of the amount of water you would need if you were growing the plants in the ground. And, um, you know, you need to add a little bit, bit of water every once in a while for evaporation, but otherwise it is a completely self-sustainable system. So um, I, have a, I have an established orchard, about 20 varieties of fruits and nuts. I have a freshwater creek that horseshoes the property. It's my survival. That's, that's where I will, when it all falls down, that's, that's where I will probably live. But um, I, uh, my life was changing. And I found that I was getting by with less and less. There were things that I just didn't need. I mean, I'd really gotten into living in California, certainly in Santa Monica for as long as I did. They, they've been separating and recycling garbage for decades. So uh, I was very into that whole green concept. And um, I stopped using a hair dryer. Uh, I just have a regular old acoustic toothbrush. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just got rid of a lot of things that I didn't need. And um, I had to rethink the way I felt about money because by now the war in Iraq had started. And morally, I find it unconscionable that my tax money goes to pay for bullets and bombs. You know, 100 years ago, 90% of casualties in war 
were soldiers on the battlefield because that's where they fought. They went to a battlefield and they fought each other. Today, 90% of casualties in war are civilians, mostly women and children killed in their own homes. And I don't want that on my conscience, that I, that I pay for that. But I didn't know what I could do. You can't stop paying taxes because you know what happens then, you finish up in prison. So I finally came to the conclusion that the only thing I could do was to earn as little as I could. <laughs> it's an interesting concept, but it works. You know, I have my social security. I still have the money from my pension fund, my, my corporate pension fund. And, uh, and I still get royalties. I can live on that. I don't charge for my hypnotherapy sessions. I don't charge for my speaking engagements. I don't need to. And I feel so much better about it because I, can, I, I sleep better at night knowing that I, I am doing as much as I can to not contribute to to what's going on. Now, I must have stirred up the universe a bit, I don't know, but I had two hypnotherapy clients in the space of eight days, both of which, both of which presented me with something I had never encountered before. I do past life regressions, um, I reunite people with family members that have passed over, it's always either a parent or a grandparent. I have had one instance of an identical twin coming through. But um, I actually got this, this, this first client. Uh, she was referred to me by a psychologist that I know and uh, who said to me, you know, I have, this, uh, I have this woman doctor that I've been treating. She has, uh, she has a metaphobia. I said, what? A metaphobia? Never heard of it. Fear of vomit. Yeah. Well, she's also a, she's a, she's a doctor. It was interfering with her practice. She and her husband wanted to start a family, terrified of morning sickness. And I said, well, I've never dealt with this before, but uh, I'll give it a try. And I called another friend of mine who's a much more experienced hypnotherapist, and I said, what do I do? He said, it's a phobia, so treat it like a phobia. So uh, I met with her, a lovely young woman, lovely young woman, Vietnamese. And um, so I, uh, I put her under, and uh, the psychologist he had, had already regressed her. She said, I, you know, I can't find anything in her childhood to account for this phobia. She said, it must be from a past life. Well, I regressed her back to, I think, age five or six, and there it was. She had witnessed this little boy in the playground. He started to vomit, and his mother clapped her hand over his mouth to stop him, and she had been very emotionally upset by how humiliated the little boy was. So we, um, and that's the thing I love about hypnotherapy, you can go to a psychoanalyst and they, it's like, a, think of a glass of beer. They poke around in the foam and the froth for years. We take a straw and we go right down and hit the problem and it's gone. So anyway, we've knocked that out like in the first 15 minutes and there's still, you know, a lot of time on the clock and she's under, so I thought, well, let's go walkies and see what else we'll find. <laughs> and so I, you know, had her going down a hallway and I said, there's someone walking towards you, let me know when you can tell if it's male or female. She said, it's male. I said, okay. I said, as the figure gets closer, tell me if it's anyone that you recognize. She said, it's Jesus. I said, what? She said, it's Jesus. She said, what's he doing here? I don't believe in him. She's a Buddhist. <laughs> and I wanted to say, well, he certainly seems to believe in you. But I... So, now there is one thing I find very frustrating about hypnotherapy, and that is it's kind of like being with someone who's on the phone. You're only getting one half of the conversation. So she's very quiet. She keeps saying over and over again, I hope he doesn't know the terrible things I've said about him. Oh. <laughs> so, 
after a while, I said, what's going on? She said, well, we're sitting down talking. She said, and I know he's talking to me because I can see his lips moving, but I can't hear what he's saying. I hope he doesn't know the awful things I've said about him. <laughs> well, I figured out later that she was so far down in shame and guilt, first chakra issues, that she'd, she'd blocked the hearing. And anyway, after the session was over, she told me, she said, um, before I, I met my husband, she said I was with this other man for seven years and he was a born-again Christian, as was all his family. And she said, I had so much Jesus rammed down my throat. She said, I just, you know. I said, well, how do you feel about it now? She said, I don't know what to think. So um, we are going to have another session, but I, I'm, I'm going to be curious to find out exactly where she is on the religious issue. <laughs> now, eight days later, I have a client scheduled to come, someone I'd met, I'd met socially at a dinner party. Uh, a young, <clears throat> young, anyone under 40 is young to me. Um, I, yeah, late 30s, early 40s, and he's Greek. Um, he works as an English teacher, but his passion is astrology. And he said, um, you know, you do past life regressions. I said, yes. He said, well, you know, I'll, I'll do a chart for you if you'll do a session for me. I said, well, you don't have to do that because I don't charge, so, you know. I said, but why don't you do a chart on my daughter because she and I are having some issues and that might be helpful. Well, eight days later, he shows up at my door and he's done two charts. He's done one on me and one on my daughter. And I am struck by his handwriting. I have never seen handwriting like it. It looks like something an ancient scribe would do. So um, anyway, I, I put him under. He goes immediately into REM, you know, rapid eye movement. And, um, you know, I take him down the hallway and I said, you know, there's a door. You'll know which door it is because you'll see the light underneath and, and that's the one that you're going to go into. Well, he gets there and we surround him with a white light and he goes, he opens the door and he says, the room's full of hay. I can smell it. And I know right away, I know. And he said, and there's animals here, and there's, there's people. He said, but they're, they're talking a language I, I don't understand. He said, a baby's about to be born. Now, I, I can't remember, I don't have my notes with me, I can't remember the exact order of the questions that I asked. But I said, you know, why are you there? He said, oh, he said, I've been waiting all my life for this. This has been predicted, and I, I had to be here. I said, well, have, have you come very far? Because he didn't speak the language. I figured he's come from somewhere else. I said, have you come very far? He said, I've come a very long way. He said, and the journey is very hard. He said, because I'm, I'm quite old. And I said, well, what do you do? And he had to think about that for a few minutes. Now, I'm talking with the Greek part of him. And the Greek part of him is, is very soft-spoken, chooses his words carefully. And I can't remember exactly how he worded it, but what he said basically was there was no modern-day equivalent for what he did. But he said, I'm, I'm very old, he said, and, and many people think of me as a wise man, and they come to me for consultation. And I said, what's your name? Melchior came out immediately in this deep, different voice. And then he says, the baby's about to be born. And the tears just start pouring down his face and he's, his whole face is transformed. And after a while, he says, the baby's here and it's a boy. I said, what's his name? He said, oh, I don't know. This is the Greek that I'm speaking to again, you see. And I said, well, ask his father. He said, we don't have a common language. I said, well, see if you can communicate with him telepathically. So he took a few minutes and he said, it's Jesus. Now, Jesus is the Greek form. The Aramaic is Yeshua. 
So I, th I found that interesting. And then he looked at the mother and he said, and that's Mary. And then he looked at the baby and the baby smiles at him. And at that moment he said, the whole room filled with this golden light. And he is just transfixed. I mean, the tears are just pouring out of him. And I just let him go. I let him be there as long as he needed to be there. And after a while he said, I need to go outside. He said, I need to be under the stars so I can pray and, and give thanks because this is the culmination of my life. I have waited all my life for this moment. And so he went out, mentally went outside and knelt down under the stars and prayed. And he was so tired, he then laid down on the ground and went to sleep. The next thing is he's looking at his body and he said, I think I've died. And I think he had to. I think his life's purpose had been fulfilled. And I think he was so old and frail that he would not have made that long journey back home again. Now, of course, being a hypnotherapist, you can't ask a leading question. So I couldn't say, were there two guys with you? I couldn't say, hey, well, I guess if you died, you didn't get to pop in on Herod. <laughs> I, I can't, you know, I can't ask any of this. And um, I, I do question a lot of stuff that's in the Bible. I mean, I, I know a lot of it has been tampered with. Um, for instance, well, I'll, I'll just tell you quickly. Years ago, I was, uh, I was a judge in a song contest in South America. And all of the contestants were singing in, in Spanish, and they had done English translations of the lyrics for me. There was one North American contestant who was singing in English, and they had done a Spanish translation of her song for all the Spanish-speaking judges. Well, they lost the original English lyrics. So they took the Spanish translation and translated it back into English. In, and so I'm, I'm sitting there, I've got the screen in front of me and she's up on the stage and she's singing, give me a chance. And I'm reading, you have been giving me the opportunity. <laughs> now how many times has the Bible been retranslated? So, for example, when I say the Lord's Prayer, I don't say, lead us not into temptation, because God is not devious. God would never lead us into temptation. I say what I believe to be the correct translation, which is, let us not be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That makes sense. Oh, here it goes again. <laughs> anyway, um... I forgot to mention Louise Hay, because that's a woman who changed my life. I was, um, I mean, when I was in the absolute depths, I found out many years later that she had her office at the bottom of my street. And I thought, oh, if only I'd known I could have gone and she could have helped me and I needn't have gone through it. Helen, hang on a minute here. You wouldn't have listened to her. You would have told her she was full of it and walked out. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to hear what she had to say. It was several years later before I, I, I went into a body, mind, spirit bookstore and I said, there is a book here that I, that I need and I need it now and please guide me to it. And boom, that was the one my hand landed on. And although I was certainly very, very familiar with the metaphysical principles that she, uh, that she talked about, and her book is so simple in its explanation, it, it is so easy to say, oh yeah, I got it, I got it, I got it, okay? You don't learn how to play a piano by reading a book. You have to do the work. And it was doing the exercises that really changed things for me. And I do use her philosophy a lot in my work with clients. In fact, I, I pour self-esteem into them. The biggest problem we all have is low self-esteem. 
And I must say, when my clients leave, they look 15 years younger. First of all, all the facial muscles are relaxed. And second of all, they feel so good about themselves. And I love that. I love that, that, that I can use her work in that, in that way. Um, she also made me take personal responsibility for my life, for the mistakes. I mean, I really believe we choose our circumstances. I believe we choose our parents. I forgave mine a long time ago. And being aware of your own power, because once you take responsibility for what has happened, you can take responsibility for changing things. You don't have to be a victim. And um, any, any part of me that was poor me is, is long gone. And I really thank Louise for that. And um, I'm not going to talk about global transformation too much because I think uh, certainly you, Dolores, covered it pretty well yesterday. Um, but we are, we are in a, a, a period of, of tremendous universal change. Um, I, I have a feeling, this is apropos of something else, but this, this plane that um, went from, was en route from Rio to Paris, um, a friend of mine uh, gave me a copy of a, of a National Geographic special which talked about this vast area of the South Atlantic where the magnetic poles have reversed. And the first reports about that plane mentioned the possibility of electromagnetic interference. And I think that's something the investigators need to look into. But um, I've been asked more than once you know, Helen, you've done so many different things in your life. What do you want to be remembered as? And I answer, being kind. Because that transcends success, it transcends wealth, it, it transcends wealth, it, it transcends anything. It is, it is your true legacy. And I've, I've said to my children, you know, at the end of life, there is only one question that really matters. And that's, is the world a better place because you were in it? And that's something, no matter what our circumstances, that we can all achieve. Simply being kind, making someone smile every day. It means a lot. And so if I can leave anything with you, and I don't know how long I've been speaking. I've got 15 minutes. Um, I have a feeling there might be a few questions, so I'd like to do Q&A for that 15 minutes, if that's okay, before I leave the final comment, which is, may the source be with you. Okay. And this is my favorite part, Q&A, so please, line up. Yeah. I can't talk too well. Well, I can't stand for that long. Right, well, well also I have Addison's, I didn't mention that I have Addison's disease, did I? Oh, what about that? Well, I have Addison's disease. Hmm? Um, no, I, 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 I'm, as long as I can hang on to something, I'm okay. Right. Yes, sir. When you were talking about the gal who was Viet Vietnam, I think? You... The Vietnamese doctor, yes. Yeah, and, and she <laughs> encountered Jesus and <laughs> her, re her violent reaction to it. It made me think of what I had read in the life and teachings of the masses of the Far East. Have you ever... Run across those books? No. By Bear T. Spaulding? No. Well, I forget whether it's in book two or book three. And Spaulding and 11 of his, uh, I don't know, associates, I guess is the best way, they went over there because he, 
He had been there previously. Went over where? To uh, uh, India. India, yeah. okay. And he was, t they went up into the Himalayas. And he spent, they spent time at a monastery there. Mm -hmm. And they were invited to a dinner party. And at the dinner party, were Jesus and the Gautama. And I tell you, it made fascinating me. <laughs> I see. And, had, and, what had they been smoking? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, Spalding was called into uh, question about uh -huh. his material because it was so fabulous. Yes. But I don't know. I, 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 from the time that I started reading those books, I never was in doubt about the validity or the authenticity of. Well, good. This, yeah. Good. But, then uh, he's then he's performing a very valuable service. Yes, and I I, I thought that was quite a, uh, a revelation, that you know they they said that they had an interesting conversation with the both of them, so. Okay. You, you might Good. let your Vietnamese... I'll, I'll see if I can track those books down. Yeah. Are you the only one? Well, come on. Helen, yes. I want you to tell the story of how you wrote the lyrics to I Am Woman. You didn't tell that story. Oh. Um, well, uh, I wanted a song. I, 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 the time of the first album, I'd been involved in the women's movement for about 10 months. And I wanted songs on the album that said something about the strength of, of women. Because, um, you know, all the ads would describe it dainty and, and, you know, nobody in my family was dainty, but boy, they were strong. And, uh, and it was the women who had kept the family together through uh, two world wars and a depression. They held jobs down and did all the housework. And there were songs at the, at the time, I mean, there was one dreadful song in the 1960s called Born a Woman. If you're born a woman, you're born to be lied to, cheated on, and treated like dirt. <laughs> but when your man comes home, you're glad it happens that way. <laughs> because to be his woman, no price is too great to pay. I mean, you, young girls were being indoctrinated into accepting domestic abuse, you know, like it was some sort of sacred right. And that had to be addressed. So I'm looking for songs, and I'm looking for songs, and I just can't find any. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to write it myself, I guess. And like I said before, I didn't associate lyrics with poetry. So I'm lying in bed, and, and the phrase, I am strong, I am invincible, I am woman, is going over and over in my head. And I wasn't even sure what invincible meant, but it sounded pretty good. So that was the beginning. And the rest of the song, I, I had to work for. But um, that, that was the genesis of the song. OK, any questions about anything at all? Yes? Last summer. In New Zealand, a white woman's skull was found on the coastline, and it's now in a museum, and it's called the Mystery Skull. I want to know if you've known, since your island is so near, do you a know? A skull. You said a, a skull. A woman. They say it's a woman's skull, but it was 300 years before Captain Cook was. Well, the Maoris were there then. Yeah, I know, but it was a white woman's skull, and it's called the. You can get it on internet. I just, yeah. I just researched this. Okay. But if. I'd like for you to, if you don't know anything about it, I, I would like for you to investigate about that white woman's skull 300 years before Captain Cook, because it's so close to where you live. It's not that close. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it could have washed up from somewhere. I, 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 I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look into it. Yeah, I'm not, please. I'm not a Googler, but I'll, I'll see what I can find out. No, I, I mean, could, is somewhat a client, a hypnosis or whatever. Yeah. I mean, if it, if, it, if it were a crystal skull, I think I'd be more interested. But, but oh, Okay, well. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. Okay. 
All right, come on, people. Ask me anything. Am I wearing jockey shorts or not? No. Okay. I just wanted to say that I think you did such a nice job of what you talked about. That's why no one has any questions. You did a oh. great job. <laughs> That's very sweet. Thank you. Thank you. But I really do. This is the part that I really love. And here's somebody with a... Yes. It seems to me that um, many diseases come from past lives. Have you investigated the origination of your Addison? Um, no, but I believe I chose to have it. Um, and it it's kind of stems from, the, from having lost the kidney because uh, they removed the adrenal gland on that side. Um, my other adrenal gland, when I saw it on an MRI, it was tiny, tiny, tiny. It was, it was infantilized. And I think I may have been born with malformed adrenals. And I've done more medical research on it. And of course, having been born during World War II, you know, my father was away. Uh, my mother was under a great deal of stress. And with anything else, um, the fetus, that, anything that the fetus needs, it will draw from the mother. Except for the adrenals, the mother will draw from the fetus. So that's, that's a possible, it's a possible cause. But, um, and I think it was, uh, it was precipitated finally by the, by the deaths. You know, it came, it came after 1973. And I had, I mean, if you've ever seen a, a stress chart, I was way off the chart. I did everything that you could possibly do. You know, lo lose parents, uh, move house, have a baby. I did it all that in that one year. So I think that's what caused it. But, um, as a GP will tell you, if you're going to have an in incurable disease, try to make it Addison's because it is manageable. I've been on cortisone for 33 years now. Okay. Yes. Thank you for mentioning Robert Kennedy. In yes. 1968, I happened to be working for the California Highway uh, Department at that time there. Yes. And uh, so I Can you get a little closer to the mic? So I remember that yeah. vividly. Yes. But later I got a book. There's a fish in the courthouse. I think the name of it was. It's a great big yellow book that I have at home. Uh -huh. That was uh, written by a policeman in L.A. that said that Robert Kennedy, just before he was assassinated, uh, found out some things about his brother John JFK. So thank you. Oh, I did you know well, what what things? <laughs> yeah. About who may have helped with the assassination of JFK. Okay. Well, it was there was there was four there was four shooters, two in front, two in back, standard assassination. Okay, but you may want to read that book if you can find it. Okay. There's a fish okay. in the courthouse. I can I could go all night on conspiracy theories, because I love investigating. Okay. Oh, Helen, I would just like to know who has regressed you. To who has regressed me? Nobody. And you've discovered your own past I, I have flashes. I have oh, flashes. I and after a while, you can start putting some of the, oh, that one belongs with that life. And yeah. Uh, you're very fortunate then. But I haven't, I haven't been, you know, there's nothing terribly interesting. <laughs> Pretty dull lives. Thank you. OK. An Egyptian princess? An Egyptian princess? Mm, no, but I did work on the pyramids. Yes. Yes, ma'am. So it feels to me like you still have a lot of wonderful musical energy in you. And while you didn't relate poetry to music before, are you still writing poetry? No. <laughs> no, no. I, um, I'm, I'm really interested in doing research. That's what I love doing now. But thank you for your question. Yes, ma'am. For someone who is sort of a neophyte at exploring some of the metaphysical things that have been presented here this weekend, can you give a couple of sources that you think have been particularly helpful for you on your journey 
in terms of education and maybe a place to start to branch off okay, from? Okay, it's a good question. Thanks. We're all different. And you're going to have to open yourself up and allow yourself to be drawn to it. Like I talked about going into the bookstore and saying there's a book here. You need to use that, okay? And you will be drawn to the right book, okay? Maybe a whole series of books. All right. Yes. What is your most memorable regression that you've done? Oh, boy. Well, certainly the Jesus ones, that, that's, they do stick in the mind. That's the top one. Um, yeah, no, there's been, some, uh, there's been some interesting ones. Um, I had someone who went back to being in a concentration camp. And um, the ones I, I particularly enjoy are um, with someone who's lost a parent and there's been conflict with that parent that was never resolved while they were in body. And then for that parent to come through and for this tremendous healing to take place. They're, they're very emotional sessions. I mean, I, I sit there crying myself. Do you, um, do you find that they come back for more than one session? Um, sometimes, but it, only if it's, it's an ongoing thing. But I, I really like to knock something out in one session. Sure. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Yes. Hi. There seems to be kind of a general agreement, certainly among most of the people in a room like this, that we're undergoing some kind of change, transformation, whatever. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could share with us some of your personal feelings about what you expect. What to expect? What you expect. Oh, what I expect. Um, well, I think uh, we're going through a DNA change as is the planet. We're, we're, we're in a period of extinction. There are a lot of species are disappearing. New species are, are emerging. Um, Darwin's theory has a flaw. He said that, that, you know, it was a slow, gradual change. But what the fossil record shows is that there are millions of years with no change and then in geologic time, sudden and abrupt change. Now, we are going through, a, our upper chakras are opening. And, um, I mean, for instance, the, um, the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, uh, served a purpose because, well, first of all, for the British, you know, during World War II, in order to, to survive, the British had to keep that stiff upper lip and everything had to be held within and, and repressed. Um, she, she opened up that, that chakra for them so that it was okay to express emotions. And I think her funeral, which I think was watched by something like a billion people worldwide, that so many people were united in grief at that moment. It was an opening up, <clears throat> excuse me, of a global heart chakra. Does that answer your question? Okay. Is that it? Yo, no, 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 no. Okay, there's more. Question, but just can you um, get right in front of the mic? Okay, Thanks. is that good? Yeah, I want to thank you. You know, I was a uh, teenager when you sang your song, and you know, we were so oppressed, and you know, things weren't fair for girls, and and you were really inspirational, and you know, letting us come and be liberated, and and now again, here you are. You know, I want to be. I'm a hypnotist, and. You know, I'm glad to see you here again and, and helping us on our way again. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, God, God willing, we'll have more women in... in uh, I, was, I was in London um, just uh, the other week, and uh, they are now saying that within 20 years, 80% of the doctors will be female, which is very encouraging. Yes, ma'am. I want to say a big, great, great big thank you. And would you sing for us? <laughs> and you can say no if you choose, but be in that mode for just this much. That ship has sailed. <laughs> Sorry. I just don't do that anymore. I have moved on. But the recordings are still available. 
Okay. One last thing. Um, I had a flash about oh three or four months ago that I might be meeting you in person, and I ran out and bought, bought a CD and and thank you and started singing in the car again to Alan and Ray. Um, when did you find out that you were going to be here? I was wondering. Um, well, uh, I met Dolores uh, in Sydney. When was it? November? November. Yeah, last November. And uh, she invited me to come here for this conference, and I thought that was a great idea. That may have been around the same timeline that I thought that you popped into my mind. Well, then you have psychic abilities. <laughs> yes, Hang it's on been to wonderful them. meeting you in person. Well, thank you. Okay, so I think if there's no one else, that's... Oh, there's someone else. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And so I shall say, as Edward R. Murrow said, good night and good luck. <laughs> okay, it's a great honor to have her here.